Today's lecture is going to be about persistent and latent infections with viruses, how viruses do it, where they go, what it is they do, and a little bit about why. So um, these are my two cats. Their names are Ava and Jaja. They're the Gabor sisters, for those of you know who that, that is. And they symbolize really what I want to talk about today, and that's summarized by um, a songwriter from the 60s, Neil Sedaka, who said, breaking up is hard to do. And I won't be talking about the cats much, really. But what I will be talking about is how viruses interact with their hosts and what the sequelae of some of these interactions are in terms of long-term persistent infections, slow infections, and latent infections. So on Monday, we touched briefly on the acute infectious cycle, what goes on when a virus infects its host, what the host response is. But I think the most important point to take away for today, not for Monday, was that an acute infection is a natural infection that is usually self-limited. You get infected, you get sick. If you're lucky, you get well, and the virus goes away. However, there are other kinds of infections. The persistent infections, also a natural infection, but they can be very long-term in nature. They can be long-term in the course of the infection, that is, take a very long time to show up, so they can be a slow infection. They can be abortive in nature, and that's where the virus does not complete its replication cycle, but manifests some of its activities, and there can be a host response to that. They can be latent, and there are instances where viruses come in and infect, and you have an overt infection, what appears to be an acute infection, and then the virus finds a place that it can leisurely rest inside of your body. And that's a latent infection. Under those conditions, little or no virus is made. The other kind of infection that we talk about is a transforming infection. And this is where a virus comes in, invades a host, and turns the host into a cancer cell. So it transforms the phenotype, also the genotype of the host. And it does that in many different ways. And I will touch on that, and Dr. Racaniello has a lecture on oncogenic viruses later in the course. So let's look again at our patterns of infection. The acute infection was summarized on Monday, and viruses such as rhinoviruses, rotaviruses, and influenza viruses give rise to acute infections. You get infected, you get sick, either upper respiratory in the case of rhino or influenza, or enteric in the case of rotavirus and then you generally get better. There's a wonderful virus of mice called lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus. It's really only wonderful because it led to uh, the discovery of the major histocompatibility locus. But what happens is that it infects the mouse and it replicates and there's no apparent infection for a very long time and very little virus made. And then long after the initial infection, virus begins to replicate and the host dies. We are probably, so, several of you are intimately familiar with latent infection with herpes simplex virus. Most, 80, 85 percent of you have been infected with herpes at some time in your life and it just doesn't leave, it stays around. And what happens is, for the unlucky few, is that there are series of recrudescence. So what happens is virus goes in, it infects, it disappears in your neural ganglia, and then you get a cold sore that's manifested as a result or a consequence of the virus being activated, reactivated from latent ganglia. That usually disappears because you have an immune response. And then we continue to see this throughout the life of the individual. Sometimes there's a long lag between these incidences, that is between the acute infection and the recrudescent infection, the recurrent infection. And that's more often seen in uh, varicella zoster virus, where the initial infection is chicken pox. How many of you have had a vaccine? Okay, so you've never seen chicken pox, but that doesn't mean that you won't see shingles. And it may or may not result from the vaccine, probably not, but from a mild infection that you had that was missed early on, and the virus has a chance to come back. And now there is a vaccine that's given to 
uh, the elderly, anybody over 60, where it's available over 60, which is supposed to help um, prevent the recurrence of varicella, which is zoster. And then we have some strange um, viruses, such as measles, causing a disease called SSP, and we'll get to that a bit later, HIV, and the human T lymphotropic viruses, where they infect and there's a rapid burst of virus replication. And then the viruses lay dormant for a very, very long time, and they begin to synthesize virus again later. Something reactivates the virus while it's latent in the cell, and death ensues. That's true for HIV, somewhat for HTLV, but measles is different because you don't actually see virus being made. Rather, virus proteins continue to be synthesized in the infected individual, and they cause this disease, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. Now, what are some of the mechanisms that can be responsible for leading to persistence? In the case of our RNA virus friends, rhino, influenza, and HIV, these viruses replicate through um, RNA and DNA intermediates, but they use uh, reverse transcriptases, which are not highly um, processive in terms of how they work, and lots of errors are made. So there tend to be antigenic changes in some of the major antigens that are deposited in the membranes of flu and HIV and in the capsid protein of rhino. Selective pressure, that is the host, the host's immune response, your memory response, can lead to shedding of virions that are resistant to clearing. So these are the virions in which there has been some change in the genomic information, something that doesn't kill the virus, but changes its antigen presentation. So they can now persist and last longer. And that's the evolution or um, drift, antigenic drift that you see with flu. So the combination of antigenic drift, changes in dominant proteins, and selection by the host because they don't have antibodies to those can result in long-term persistent infections and uh, continued spread of these viruses. Now, what is a persistent infection? It occurs when the primary infection is not cleared. So when you have failure of either the adaptive immune response or the innate immune response, and the virus continues to proliferate or to find a place within the host where it can live, you get a persistent infection. And in the case of viruses such as Epstein-Barr virus, herpes simplex virus, HIV, the virus, the genomes and or proteins can continue to be produced for years. So if you're infected with human immunodeficiency virus, you continue to make virus for years and years and years, even at very, very level, uh, even when uh, people are infected and treated, they make virus at very, very low levels. Now, some of these, whoops, some of these infections are chronic, and those are eventually cleared. So the infection is long-term, but eventually the host's immune system can respond. And others, the ones that we call latent, persist for your lifetime. So once a herpes virus gets into your nervous system, it's not going away. Once it gets into your lymphoid system, it's not going to go away. It's going to find a reservoir where it can set up residence. Some of the general properties of latent infections, gene products promoting replication are not made. And that makes sense. Special polymerases, special proteins that are involved in uh, gathering host proteins to make replication complex, they're not made. Why? Because if they are made, then the virus will enter into either a lytic replication cycle or an abortive replication cycle. Abortive replication cycles are almost always recognized by the cell or frequently recognized by the cell, and the cell will apoptose and kill itself, and the virus will be eliminated. Any proteins that are made are found in very low concentrations. Again, one of the things that a virus wants to do is to avoid being recognized by the host. You do that best by appearing not to be there. And in other cases, we find that some virus proteins are made that are important for replication, but they're in the wrong place. So instead of being in a nucleus where they're needed for transcription or replication of a virus genome, 
or out in the uh, cytoplasm for encapsidation. Proteins are made in small amounts, but they just don't find the right place to be. Cells with latent genomes are almost always masked from immune surveillance, and there are several reasons for that, sometimes because of the low antigen output, and sometimes because of the cell in which they are harbored. So if you're in a neuron, you present very little antigen. If you're in a resting B or T cell, you present very little antigen. So in that fashion, the infected cell can persist and the virus hides. Why do the viral genomes persist? They persist so that they can reactivate and spread to a new host. If the virus dies with the host, it doesn't have a chance to spread its wealth and share it with anybody else, so it's sort of lonely. The exception that we'll talk about is measles and SSPE, and that's because in that case, as you'll see, the virus doesn't really replicate. It's just bits and pieces of it. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you quite a bit about Epstein-Barr virus, in particular its replication cycle during latency. And the reason for that is that when it infects, there are novel transcription and replication patterns. So if the virus is lytically infected, so when people develop mononucleosis, which is usually the first infection with Epstein-Barr virus, the virus initially replicates in B cells and that has a lytic replication pattern. The virus, of course, stays there, and we'll see how that happens in a bit, and stops making new virus. So you go from making virus to no more new virus. But for a virus to successfully coexist with its host in a cell ha that has replication potential, it must replicate. So it finds a way to time its replication with a host. And we'll see that for the human papillomaviruses that cause warts and uh, several different kinds of human squamous cell carcinomas, and we'll see it for Epstein-Barr virus. Adenovirus, which is more commonly associated with a cold-like symptom, also infects lymphoid tissue. And when you look in the lymphoid tissue, you see virus genomes. You see a few virus transcripts, RNAs, but very little viruses, and it turns out when you go to culture these lymphocytes, they don't support efficient virus replication. What they do is they make very, very, very small amounts of virus. But that's enough sometimes to come back and uh, haunt the host. Now, um, here's my list of things you don't want to know about. But these are various viruses. The sites where they persist, adenoviruses in the adenoids, oddly enough, tonsils and lymphocytes. Consequences are unknown, but we believe it may lead to spread of infectious virus. Epstein-Barr virus, a virus that can populate B cells and also epithelial cells and cause several different kinds of uh, carcinomas. So uh, it causes lymphoma. It causes the benign proliferative disease, mononucleosis, and it causes a, a solid cell tumor, carcinoma. And we go on and on from representatives from many of the groups of viruses that you've heard about during the course, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. They populate in the liver, and they eventually lead to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. The polyomavirus family, which can live in the kidneys, the central nervous system, and a more recently described virus that we'll talk about at the end of the lecture that causes a disease called Merkel cell carcinoma. And the sequelae are here, the viruses are here. It's just interesting to look at them and correlate them, and certainly not for you to know which one does what, but to be aware of the sites that they inhabit and the ways in which um, they manifest themselves. So how do you promote persistence? I've told you uh, a good way is to fail, have the innate immune system fail to clear an acute infection. Another good way is to block apoptosis, let the virus replicate to a low level, find another host, and then persist in that case. Usually what happens is it's a combination of both of these factors. Remembering that viruses will frequently trigger the host to apoptose, but they also have proteins and information that can block apoptosis. What are the host's contributions to persistence? Two organs, the eyes and the neurons, 
are devoid of initiators and effectors of the immune system. And the reason that we believe that's true is because if you had a vigorous immune response in either the eye or the brain, that would be extremely detrimental to the host. And we know that that's true. We know that if you have severe um, encephalitis, inflammation uh, of the brain, that the sequelae are very, very serious. You can shut down everything because the in inflammation destroys tissue. The same is true of the eye. So when you have an immune response, the virus is replicating, yes. The virus is killing cells, yes. But it's the immune response that causes most of the damage. So persistent infection of these organs is relatively common. If you get infected with a herpes virus or an adenovirus in the eye, it goes on for weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks. And we don't understand why, but um, there are lots of, of good model systems that are being looked at. Now, when you talk about persistence, you ask the question, where is the virus genome? What is it doing? And for herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus, they live in neurons. HIV lives in memory T cells. These cells have something in common. They're non-dividing cells. So the cells at rest, think of them as Z G0. Under those conditions, you usually have a non-replicating genome. And in the case of HSV and VZV, these virus chromosomes are present in episomal form. They're circular molecules. In the case of HIV, it's been integrated into the host chromosome. For, hepatite, uh, for human papillomaviruses, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and Epstein-Barr virus and Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, these are both DNA viruses. These are all, uh, excuse me, these are RNA viruses, and that's a DNA virus. You have autonomous self-replicating chromosomes in a dividing cell. So they're host cells, liver cells, lymphoid cells in some stages of replication, and the uh, stem cells of the epidermis, the basal layer of a developing epidermis for human papillomaviruses, allow these chromosomes to exist in circular forms with the host. And as those cells divide, or when those cells divide, this forms a signal that provides for replication of the virus. For the most part, the virus will use host machinery along with a couple of virus proteins. The other um, state is the integrated state in the host chromosome. And this is when it replicates with the host. Parvoviruses do that. They are, um, rel we believe them to be relatively benign passages in the human genome. And human herpes virus 6 has an unusual niche in uh, human chromosomes. And I'll get to that at the end of the lecture. Now, here's a case of a single virus, an RNA virus, Synbus virus. When you inject it into adult mouse brain, you get a persistent non-cytopathic infection. The mouse lives, the virus replicates at low levels, and they are sort of symbiotes. If, on the other hand, you take that same virus and you inject it into a neonatal mouse brain, you get a lethal infection. The virus replicates, it overwhelms the host, the hosts die. So what's different about these two? It's all about the milieu. And it turns out that neonatal neurons in that newborn mouse lack proteins that block virus-induced apoptosis. You block apoptosis, you can keep things down on the farm. Measles is a paramyxovirus, and it causes this very bizarre disease that occurs years after the initial infection. There is no known animal reservoir for measles, so every one of you should get vaccinated because the only way it gets spread is from human to human. It's extremely contagious. There are about 40 million cases a year, despite the fact that uh, we have vaccines for it. It results in a systemic immunosuppression of the people who are infected. But the sequela is lifelong immunity. You don't get infected a second time. So that's why vaccination is apparently so successful for this virus. If you look at the virus shown here and its replication cycle in people, 
you find out that there are two stages that are viremic. So initially, we have a primary viremia, and that occurs usually as an infection of the upper respiratory system. If you look in the mouth of an infected individual, you see what are called giant cells. There are cells that fuse as a consequence of elaboration of the measles glycoprotein. That glycoprotein will cause cells to fuse, and when you look at these fused cells, you can see actual replication factories in the cytoplasm. Subsequently, it spreads to the entire reticuloendothelial uh, system, and the virus gets shed. It then goes through the draining uh, lymph nodes and enters systemically into the body, and we see epithelial necrosis. Well, think of that as dots on the body. Antibody is made in response to this. The virus spreads to many different body surfaces, particularly all over, and we get the disease that we commonly call uh, measles, which is seen as a fever and a rash. And then the individual recovers. And you see it takes about three weeks for this whole thing to elaborate itself. An individual is infectious after the primary viremia and the secondary viremia. There are rare complications where the virus invades the brain and causes an encephalitis, an inflammation of the meninges and whatnot. And, whoops, and this rare disease, SSPE. So, this is your giant cell. And if you look carefully, you can see that many cells have fused. There's a, a single nucleus in this cell. And there are all these bodies of, um, excuse me, there, there's more than one nucleus. But there are all these bodies of replicating uh, measles virus factories. These are what are called coplic spots. And those are indicative of measles infection, and they're found in the oral cavity. And as you can see, here's a kid, a rock star, who's uh, been infected with measles and has lesions all over the body because the virus spreads systemically. Now, occasionally, measles enters the brain in infected lymphocytes. So it gets by the blood-brain ba barrier. And it's believed that when this happens, there is some leakage in the brain, and antibody blocks cell-cell fusion. So the normal way in which measles spreads to adjacent cells during the course of infection. The consequences of, of this is the removal of the fusion protein from the cell surface, and that allows for persistence of portions of the virus. So not the whole virus genome, but portions of it. Nobody understands how that happens. Um, what we do understand, though, is that a consequence of that is a slow infection, not a persistent one because you're not really making virus. What you're doing is you're making these nucleocapsids and these nucleoprotein complexes, which accumulate in the infected cell and so slowly spread to adjacent cells. This whole process can take six to eight years, and there's uh, no known treatment for it, but it's rare, so that's good. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a latency primer on herpes viruses. There are um, eight different human herpes viruses, and they're divided broadly into three groups, the alpha, vi alpha viruses, the beta viruses, and the gamma viruses. And in part, this is due to the cell sites that they predominantly inhabit, but more often it's due to a combination of that and what the consequences of infection are. So simplex and varicella are neurotropic, their favorite home is neurons. And the default pathway of infection with these virus is lytic. You get infected with herpes virus, you see it, well, you see the recrescence, recrudescence as a cold saw, but in an initial infection, you'll see a lesion at the site of infection. And that results from replication in epithelium. For the beta herpes viruses, cytomegalovirus, and human herpes virus 6, they prefer cells of lymphoid origin. They tend to, uh, infection occurs as a result of, um, it can be in uh, mother's milk, it can be found in semen, it can be found in saliva. So those are the ways in which the virus can be spread, and the first target is lymphoid organ, and the default pathway is lytic, replication of new viruses. When they go latent, 
they tend to inhabit um, cells of the lymphoid uh, origin, B cells, T cells, macrophages. The gamma herpes viruses, such as Epstein-Barr virus and Kaposi sarcoma virus, are markedly lymphotropic, but Kaposi sarcoma virus forms a sarcoma. Epstein-Barr virus also can be uh, found to cause nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is an epithelial cell carcinoma. And their default pathway is not lytic, rather it's latent. So their first manifestation of the infectious cycle tends to be a latent infection. How are some of these replication processes controlled in the infected cell? In the case of HSV, there are a family of transcripts called latency-associated transcripts that are derived from a single region of the virus chromosome. And I'll show you what that looks like in a bit. And these guys accumulate in the nucleus of infected cells in the neurons, neural bodies, and we don't know what they do. We do know that they have two open reading frames. Nobody's ever seen a protein that could be encoded by them, and they don't make it out into the cytoplasm. So that's pretty unclear as to what the sequelae are, but we know that this is necessary. Varicella zoster virus actually makes a few of its very important replication proteins, but they never get back into the nucleus. Rather, they reside in the cytoplasm. So it's as though they've been trapped and they accumulate in the wrong place. Right protein, wrong time. Epstein-Barr virus proteins. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus synthesizes a family of proteins, one of which is important for replicating the viral genome in a dividing cell, and that's called EBNA, E-B-N-A, Epstein-Barr virus nuclear antigen, and a small membrane protein called LMP2. It also encodes some small viral RNAs, and they may be similar to the VA RNAs that we talked about with adenovirus and how it effectively regulates PKR. We know that they're required to maintain the latent state, and we also know that they modulate the host response. So they dampen presentation of antigen. HCM, HCMV and KSHV are known to produce microRNAs that are thought to play a role not only in the establishment of latency, but also in the maintenance of latency. And one of the interesting things that has been um, revealed in the last couple of years is that these microRNAs correlate with the cell that's infected. So if it's in one organ, it makes one family of microRNAs. If it's in a different cell host, then it makes another cell host. So these are the ways in which cytomegalo can enter your body through the conjunctiva, through the um, respiratory tract, through sexual transmission, and all of these lead to a primary infection which involves uh, lymphoid tissue. Both epithelial and lymphoid cells are infected. And that's interesting. We don't know what the outcome of infection of epithelial cells are. Most of the time in the laboratory, those are the hosts, and the virus replicates quite well in them. But the actual outcome of this um, in a child or an individual who's infected is not clear. Most infections are subclinical. That's true with every virus that we talk about, with the possible exception of something like Ebola. And that is, you really don't know that you're infected. But if you look within a population and you examine them for antibodies and antibody responses, you'll find that the great majority of people are infected. Cell-mediated immunity is required for resolution of infection. And we spoke about that on Monday. It's an important component. You've got to invoke both antibody and cellular immunity in order to get rid of uh, these viruses. When they do establish, they establish latency in bone marrow progenitors and macrophages. So if you're in a bone marrow progenitor, you're in a cell that's going to hang around for a very, very long time. And you have the opportunity to then populate different cell types. And what we do know, do know is that repression of cell-mediated immunity leads to recurrence. Anybody who's on any sort of um, uh, antibody repressive therapy is going to have activation of these viruses. Early on, we saw it in people who were infected with HIV, transplant patients, um, somebody who has measles, and they find that the immune system is slightly suppressed, can show reactivation of any of these uh, viruses. 
Infections in utero with HCMV can be devastating, and children who are infected in utero or uh, neonates tend to be deaf. They tend to have um, hearing problem, uh, excuse me, vision problems, and there tends to be some mental retardation. Early childhood, less so. So once uh, the child grows up a little bit, has a functional immune system, then the infection is not as devastating. The virus does persist in sa salivary glands, and a frequent way of infecting another young person is in a daycare center, where these kids run over and slobber on each other, and they kiss each other, and they're happy to see each other, and they're truly happy to share what they have with each other. <laughs> we now know that um, nursing mothers can transmit virus um, through lactating milk, and that the virus is also found in semen. Now, uh, as I said to you before, reactivation can have some dire consequences. It's frequently, or was first noticed in blood transfusions, and it's one of the reasons that blood is now screened for antibody to human cell megalovirus. When you transfer infected cells to an individual, you frequently reactivate um, the virus. More common in organ donations, and that's because if you think about transferring or transplanting an organ, you realize that you can't survey the entire organ for virus. And it's that changing milieu, taking the organ from one body into another, that results in reactivation. I told you uh, just before that microRNA is expressed by CMV, both in vitro and in vitro and vivo, are tissue specific, and they're associated with a specific stage of virus infection. This virus replicates very, very, very slowly. It takes days to replicate. And during the course of its infectious cycle, it produces all those proteins that we talked about on Monday that are involved in blocking the immune response. <clears throat> and it also elaborates families of microRNAs at different times. So what's the first rule of latency? Without reactivation, there's no latency. If you don't make new virus, the virus isn't really latent. It's sort of just there. Without reactivation, there's no advantage to the virus as the virus never has an opportunity to spread. If you don't make new virus, how is it going to propagate? How is it going to hang around? And viruses are really good at hanging around. So let's get back to herpes simplex virus. 80% of you are seropositive with either HSV1 or HSV2, and they used to divide pretty much at the belt line, but things have changed over the years, and I'm sure you can figure out why that might be. Um, there are 250 million people in the U.S. that have latent virus, so almost everyone, and about 40 million will experience recurrence during the course of a year. Now, recurrence is something you think of as a cold sore, either oral or genital, and that's overt. That's pretty obvious. But it turns out that there are a lot of people who shed virus. They actually recrudesce, new virus is made, and you can titrate and find new virus without any signs of an overt lesion. So that's a good reason uh, for wondering about who your sex partner is and what they're doing. How does this infectious cycle work? Herpes usually enters at the epithelial boundary, either through a small tear or because it can. It, it elicits an interferon response, which tends to keep the initial infection fairly local, except in, in, in those, are, again, who are immunocompromised. And it replicates in these epithelial cells. The epithelial cells are adjacent to dendrites of sensory neurons. So they have the opportunity to enter through the nerve endings travel all the way up the axon. So they shed their envelope, but they keep that tegument that we talked about uh, many moons ago and make it up to the neural body, the neuron body. It's true also for the sympathetic ganglia. The portal of entry is a little bit different because the innervation is blood vessels, glands, and follicles. But the pattern is the same. And then some very interesting things happen. The virus must undergo some sort of limited replication. 
Why? Because when you look in a single neuron, you find more than one virus genome. And unless you've been infected with multiple virus particles, it's hard to conceive how that might occur. The other thing is that there are frequently satellite cells, which are supporting cells in their, the nervous system, that are also infected. They don't go to the epithelial. So they must be infected as a result of some sort of limited replication in neuronal bodies. How does that happen? We don't know, but it's an interesting problem. So <clears throat> just to recapitulate, nuclear, nuclear capsid travels up the axon. This protein that's responsible for initiating infection, VP16, the transcriptional activator that comes in with a virus particle that's important for turning on the immediate early gene uh, family is separated from nucleocapsid. And we believe that separation occurs in the axon. axon. There is limited productive infection. It's not clear how that happens. This guy has been separated and it's thought to uh, mostly partition in the axon before it gets to the neuron body, which is mostly cytoplasmic. There's local inflammation from astrocytes, which are sort of the micro, uh, astrocytes and microglia, which are uh, sort of like macrophages in the brain. And then the genome is silenced and coated by nucleosomes. We know that it's not methylated. So the epigenetic silencing of this genome occurs as a consequence of its forming uh, regular arrays of nucleosomes in a plasmid-like array inside the nucleus. There are multiple copies of virus DNA another curiosity. But what we do note is that in all cases, there's nuclear accumulation of the latency associated transcription units. So what do LATs do? The answer to that question very briefly is we don't really know. But here are some interesting facts. This is the region of the herpes virus chromosome from which LATs are derived. They are transcribed antisense to two important virus genes. One is ICP0. I told you about that on Monday. It's a gene that is a transcriptional activator. It's a gene that's responsible for taking apart nuclear domain tens. And the other is a neurovirulence gene called 34.5. And if you recall, that's the gene that activates protein phosphorylase 1A. And that's the one that uh, stops the action of PKR. LAT itself contains two ORFs, but no protein has ever been associated with them. But from the LAT sequence, one can derive a series of microRNAs whose action would be perfect for inhibiting translation of these um, mRNAs. There's only one problem. You never see these mRNAs in neurons. It doesn't mean that the virus is not constantly attempting to reactivate, to reinitiate its transcriptional program, and maybe that's when they're important, but um, it's hard to find one in several hundred million cells that's doing something. So, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, why are neurons a good place for herpes viruses to live? They don't replicate or divide. So once the genome is there, it's sort of been put into a safe, and a safe place. It's locked up and it's stored away until it can uh, be used again. The brain-blood barrier provides a wonderful uh, way to escape antivirals. And unless that's breached, either artificially <coughs> or as a consequence of the infection, no antiviral will get to the brain. And the same problem exists for immune surveillance. But the biggest question is, how does a neuron that's infected survive the primary infection? How does it let virus DNA replicate? It must form some new virus particles. And we know that because surrounding neuronal bodies are frequently infected. And we know that because the satellite cells that don't innervate the epithelium are also infected. And why are there multiple copies of DNA? All great questions that I can't answer.
but I hope you will. So, in a ganglion, you have thousands of neurons, and you have thousands of neuronal bodies. There are cues elaborated by the host in response to something that causes virus to reactivate, but really only a few. And you only see virus if you look actively for virus at uh, neural ganglia extracted at post from uh, somebody who lets you take those neurons. Um, you only find one in thousands that is actually making new virus. Virions appear in mucosal tissue innervated by latently infected ganglia, and blisters ensue. All right, so that's reactivation. That's your cold sore. What happens to the surrounding neurons post-reactivation? So that's another question. You have a neuron. It's reactivated. It makes new virus. That virus can travel down the axon, right down to the dendrites, reach out, touch your epithelium, and give you a cold sore. What about the guy right next door to it? Why is there no Q? Why isn't that not um, infected? Or if it is infected, why is it not reactivated? That's another good question. So as I told you before, many times reactivation is silent and virus is shed. No apparent overt infection. And how is the virus infection masked from the host immune response? In part because it's in neurons. And neurons don't effectively present antigen. They don't have to because there aren't a lot of lymphocytes around. So they're not heavily involved with it. The other reason is that the virus is probably doing something <clears throat> that we don't understand to uh, repress an immune response. What flips the switch? Those of you who have cold sores know a midterm exam on Monday might do that. Um, exposure to the sun, some sort of stressful situation. High levels of glucocorticoids can do this. And in model systems, a protein such as ICP0 can reactivate. So that's, again, one of those immediate early gene products. If we take or if we find a way to introduce that into neurons that have been explanted, we can reactivate virus. But how do you turn this gene on when you don't make that protein? Well, there was a very elegant study done about three years ago, which just totally confused everybody. And it's done in mice, and mice are not man. But <clears throat> what it suggests is that when you reactivate, this is one of the first gene products that are made. And instead of it being regulated in the normal fashion at the end of the infectious cycle, when it can be put into a new virion, it's made sometime in response to stress. And they think that that's one way in which you can turn on immediate early genes. Hasn't been tested in people. People are tough to test things in. They don't want to give up their neural ganglia. OK, so just to um, recapitulate for you, here's your virus infectious cycle. It enters, it sheds its tegument proteins, turns on its immediate early genes, it replicates its DNA, late genes are expressed, particles egress. And these infectious particles are now available to infect the dendrites. What we know is that there's very little, if any, immediate early gene expression. LAT is expressed. The genome is silenced. Apoptosis is inhibited in infected neurons. And a latent infection is established. Are there viral gene products made? Maybe. If they are made, they're only made in very rare cells and only occasionally. These viral genomes then get maintained in a stable state within uh, your neurons. And something comes along to make life unhappy for you, but happy for the virus. And the virus is reactivated from the latent infection and goes back down that axon and infects the epithelium. <clears throat> now, herpes has a very close friend, varicella zoster virus. I told you that many of the genes could be exchanged with each other. But they do things somewhat differently. Like measles, varicella undergoes a primary and a secondary viremia. It enters through conjunctiva or the respiratory tract. Frequently, young children are infected by their grandparents who, knowingly or not, 
have either an overt case of shingles or are shedding varicella. And they then share that um, with their grandchild. So another good reason to get immunized. There's a primary viremia that occurs in local lymph nodes. Uh, excuse me, replication in local lymph nodes leads to a primary viremia. This then seeds organs, internal organs, where the virus also replicates. And then we have a secondary viremia. This secondary viremia is the one that comes out and elaborates itself all over the body. And it's interesting to watch if you've got a brother or a sister or somebody who isn't um, uh, immunized. Pox start in one place and then spread radially. It doesn't come out all over your body at once the way something like measles does. But it's that infection of the skin that leads to infection of sensory ganglia in the nervous uh, system. Epstein-Barr virus is another herpes virus, but it's of this gamma type. And again, 95% of you are seropositive, and you carry the virus genome. The virus can be the causal agent of a variety of lymphoma-like diseases, Hodgkin's lymphoma, infectious mononucleosis, which is benign but can ruin your semester, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is an infection which is mostly relegated to southeastern China, and the basis for that is not particularly clear, and Burkitt's lymphoma, which is a lymphoma which occurs in areas of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where malaria um, is frequently endemic. So in those cases, there are probably cofactors which alter um, the outcome of infection. EBV's life cycle is quite a bit different from simplex. Primary um, infection occurs through saliva, where the virus will replicate it to a limited extent in epithelial cells, and then go into the circulating system and infect the resting B cell. <clears throat> when it infects the resting B cell, it can elaborate a whole bunch of virus proteins, these nuclear antigens, these latent membrane proteins. And if they express too much, then they're recognized by cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. But if they only express EBNA and LMP2, they're actually not seen. LMP2 is a protein that goes in and out of the membrane. And only very, very small portions of it are actually seen um, in the infected individual. But these cells become latently infected resting memory B cells. So they're around for a very long time. And again, for reasons we don't quite understand, they can be reactivated. When they're re reactivated, they're seen by CTLs. But they also make virus when they're reactivated. And they go back out, and they can infect um, through the uh, epidermal cells. And you can transmit this in your saliva. So what comes in goes out, and you can always share that. This can also be a, um, in a parent infection. So mononucleosis is an overt, but virus can be made as well. In a latently infected B cell, the virus chromosome is a self-replicating episome. It replicates with the host. We'll go into that in ad nauseum. It associates with nucleosomes, so it looks like chromatin. It has the same structure as a host genome. Unlike herpes simplex virus, the latent Epstein-Barr virus has methylated CPG residues. So the epigenetic control of this genome, to some extent, is mediated as a consequence of host methylation of the virus genome. Very few virus genes are expressed, and infected cells home to bone marrow and lymphoid organs, where they can sit for quite some time. They're not seen by CTLs or virus-specific antibody because only that LMP protein is elaborated at the cell surface. And as it turns out, EBNA1 is one of those proteins that gloms up the proteasome, so peptides are not presented at the surface of infected cells. And virions are produced in only a very small fraction of cells. So here is your cell, your native resting B cell that gets infected by Epstein-Barr virus, infection results in activation. So you recall from Monday, when B cells are activated, they migrate to germinal centers, where there are various signals that are uh, elaborated, which result in expansion 
clonal expansion of the infected cell. And these infected cells are a wonderful source for making human monoclonal antibody. So that's of some value. Unfortunately, they're also a source for making more virus and reactivating or just sitting as long-term uh, latent memory B cells. What happens when a B cell divides? Well, that episomal virus genome, present in relatively low copy number, has to replicate so that it can be shared with its daughter cell. So for it to be distributed, it has to replicate in concert with a host so that it can use the host's DNA and segregation apparati to allow for um, <clears throat> spread of virus genome into the daughter cell. Epstein-Barr virus accomplishes this by having two origins for DNA replication. One, Ori-Lit is used for lytic replication when you want to make new virus. That's when the virus rolls out large numbers of virus genomes, very high copy numbers, and infectious virus um, particles ensue. ORIP for plasmid is used for episomal replication in latently infected cells. And there are only a few copies of viral DNA in the latently infected cell. So replication of episomal, nucleosome coded, virus genome is synchronized with the host. Why? So that it can share. ORIP is normally quiescent. But it gets, and <clears throat> excuse me, it gets bound by a virus protein, EBNA1, and host proteins, which result in first repression, so CDC6 and CDT1, which are kinases and important proteins that are involved in initiating DNA replication in S phase, will bind this genome and sequester it in the presence of EBNA1. But EBNA1 on its own forms what's called a stable origin recognition complex. So this protein finds this origin on the episomal DNA and sits there waiting for a series of events to occur. And those are events that are involved in cell cycle. So if you go back to biology 101, you'll remember that we have our phases G1, S, G2, and M. And in G1, the viral genome is quiescent. It has its origin replication complex and it's bound by CDC6 and CDT1. This complex recruits a host protein that's made in G1 called MCM. The complex forms only at the G1S boundary. So only when you get here where DNA synthesis can be initiated do you see this pre-replication complex form. And then the cell does a lot of cool things. The cell produces a protein called geminin whose goal is to sequester CDT1 from the origin, so it grabs it off. And once you remove CDT1, you release CDC6. That gets phosphorylated and degraded. You now have phosphorylation of the origin replication complex. And this looks just like the replicating SV40 molecule that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. The only difference is that there's only one round of DNA replication. So these genomes replicate with the host once per division cycle. And that's called replication licensing. Once it finishes its round of DNA replication, the replicated uh, genome is segregated as it goes through mitosis. And in mitosis, geminin is degraded. CDT, <coughs> CDC1, CD, bleh, CDT1 is released, goes back and forms a complex with CDC6 on the ORC, and you recapitulate this whole process. So that's how replication is controlled. HHV6 is a beta herpes virus, also present in high um, uh, seropositivity in humans. It's the causal agent of something called sixth disease, or exanthem subitum. And that presents as this mild rash all over the body, and it all comes at once. Like the other herpes viruses that I've told you about, it persists for the life of the individual, but it does it differently. There are no circular episomal forms in an infected cell. Rather, this virus has sequences at its ends that are telomeric, 
They look just like the sequences that compose telomeres, the ends of chromosomes. And that allows them to integrate into the telomeres so that they are found in this configuration at the end of here, chromosome 17, telomere region, intact virus genome, a little more telomere. And when this reactivates in the immunosuppressed, this whole virus genome pops out. So here, we have a plausible strategy for integration as a way for a virus to persist. Human papillomaviruses are not um, carried by frogs, for some of those of you who once thought you got warts from frogs. Rather, there are at least 100 distinct types of human papillomaviruses. And they are typed on the basis of their um, GC content, their genetic constitution. Genomes vary by more than 10%, constitute a unique uh, type. They segregate into mucocutaneous and cutaneous types, wet and dry skin. They also segregate into what are called high and low risk viruses. Low risk viruses cause warts, usually self-limiting. High risk viruses will cause what are called intraepithelial ne neoplasias, which can on rare occasions progress and uh, form cancers. They're particularly uh, important in, in penile, vulval, and cervical uh, carcinoma. What does a papillomavirus do? It enters the epithelial through a tear. And um, for the sexually transmitted viruses, usually during intercourse. And it establishes residence in the stem cells that form the basal layer of the developing epithelium. Epithelium develops, if you don't know, by these basal cells dividing and then differentiating as they move up through the striatum until they become keratinized dead cells. What's amusing is that the virus replicates very poorly down here, but replicates its DNA <clears throat> so that there are random cells in the basal layer that have viral sequences in it. Each time they divide, the daughter cell gets some, the mother cell retains what it has. So that's from the episomal replication, daughter cell, mother, mother cell. But as the cells mature and differentiate, they can initiate the program of virus transcription and translation, get virus genomes to replicate, make new transcripts, make viral proteins, and the only time you see virus in infected epithelium in, is in these uh, dead keratinized cells. They're full of virus. So it's part and parcel of the virus's um, replication cycle, working with the host um, differentiation cycle to uh, get new virus. So I think we've been through this. If you interrupt this program of terminal differentiation, that is, the host cells don't divide, then what happens is the virus genome can integrate into the host, and then it expresses two proteins known as E6 and E7, and these are virus oncogenes. And what they do is they take hold of the cell cycle, and they alter it to put drive cells into uh, rapid division and carcinoma-like um, situations. The intact virus genomes can persist in basal cells as episomes. Again, like Epstein-Barr virus, the genomes divide as the episomes with the host, and there's no infectious virus. This is a picture of the uh, cartoon of the HPV genome, and if you open it up at this site, what you'll realize is that there's predominantly a single promoter for transcription of all the Epstein-Barr virus open reading frames. Some of these are spliced, some of them are not. That's not relevant. But what you need to be aware of is that the late genes are together, transcribed as a unit and spliced in different places. And the early genes overlap with one another. And depending upon how they're spliced, uh, they elaborate different proteins. In the course of integration of the virus genome, the virus invariably integrates around the promoter or in some region downstream of the early genes that separates them from being actively transcribed. So these guys can be made in low amounts, and the rest of the virus proteins, so the things that are downstream of here, tend not to be 
transcribed because they've been separated from their promoter. There are six known members of the group, and they cause a variety of diseases, some of them benign, some of them are found uh, in infected kidney, some of them are associated with encephalopathies, and the Merkel cell carcinoma, which you'll see in a minute. These viruses can all cause tumors in animals, but only this Merkel cell virus is associated with a human tumor. Other papillomaviruses, however, appear to latently infect humans. And you may or may not know, but patients who have multiple sclerosis are frequently treated with a drug called Tasabri, which suppresses the immune system. And in that case, there are rare instances of these patients, <coughs> these patients developing a fatal encephalopathy from activation of one of these human papillomaviruses. So infection with JC or BK, names of uh, some of these viruses, leads to progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So you get a brain disease which re results from an encephalitis. Myelin is lost and not replaced by oligodendrocytes. That's terminal damage to the brain. Nerves become damaged, and over time they stop working. So that's uh, not pleasant. I told you just now about uh, MS and Tasabri, and the occurrence is something less than 1%, but when you think about it, it's better than uh, surviving with MS. Because Tasabri can be a radical treatment that helps many of these people uh, lead a normal life. So here's uh, a quote from Dr. Racaniello in 2009. And it was really quite prescient. He says, given the high seroprevalence of polyomaviruses in humans, it's not surprising that there are significant pathogens in the immunosuppressed populations. The important question is why these viruses can peacefully coexist in many humans without causing disease. Are we simply carrying them as passengers, or do they benefit us in some unknown ways? In other words, is there some type of commensal relationship between virus and host? Well, here's our Merkel cell carcinoma. And it looks, um, looks pretty ugly. I think you'd agree with me. Merkel cells are neuroectodermal in origin, and they tend to sit in the epithelium and interact with neurons. What's not appreciated is that this is extremely rare. What is appreciated is that it's extremely deadly, and how to treat it is not at all clear. But in the limited part of the population that develops these lesions, they spread all over the body. And if excised very early on, that can be somewhat preventative. But what we do know about it is that it results from infection with this polyoma-like virus that is closely related to primate vi viruses in terms of their T antigen synthesis. And the other thing we know about it is that these viruses are found integrated in a clonal pattern. That it means that one cell was infected. That infected cell was stimulated to replicate and divide forming a clone of same cells, all of which have the virus integrated in the same place. The bizarre thing is that these tumors have mutations in T antigen. And as a result of that, the virus genome, which under normal circumstances can be excised with a, with a proficient T antigen, or not. But the T antigen remains expressed and that, as you'll recall, is involved in stopping regulation of cell cycle. So integrated virus genomes are not excised. Cells survive and go on and multiply and cause this uh, malignant disease. And finally, I'd like you to remember that viruses preferentially target slowly dividing or non-dividing cells so that they can establish themselves in a latent fashion. They adopt a variety of survival strategies that can coordinate their replication with the host, coordinate their expression with different periods in the life cycle or, or what the host is doing, and that also allows them to persist. They fly under the radar. They're not seen by the immune system in the infected cells. And in response to a variety of stimuli, these latent genomes can, on occasion, reactivate. Thank you.